as Gerard just mentioned, I'm currently working at DeepSeq at the University of Nottingham, and this is a multi-platform sequencing facility where we're certified service providers of Promethean and Gridiron. And we like to pr we provide an end-to-end -end sequencing service, um, in which includes doing the DNA extraction, all QC steps and library prep steps, doing the sequencing, and we also <laughs> provide data analysis. Um, the first part of my talk, I'm going to focus on extracting and sequencing ultra-high molecular weight DNA. So I think um, several talks over the last couple of days have really driven home the importance of, um, or sort of the benefits of ultra-long reads in improving assembly contiguity, um, closing gaps in genome assemblies, and for resolving highly complex genomic repeat regions and detecting large structural variants. Um, soon, after start, soon after I started working at DeepSeq, um, I was lucky enough to be involved in two large collaborative projects where we needed to um, perform over 50 ultra-long sequencing runs on MinIron and then later on GridIron. Um, after, a f after a first couple of quite disastrous runs, um, we made some minor tweaks to the protocol and we were fairly soon able to get quite, um, quite nice run metrics from these. So just showing here, this is one of our fairly early runs. Um, we started to get very nice read length distributions. Um, I'm showing, I'm kind of showing off here. This is our run, one of our runs where we um, started to see mix, started to see um, reads of over one megabase um, popping into our run metrics. Um, and this is particularly significant because this 1.3 1.3 megabase read allow us to um, allow us to take the Ashes Trophy from an Australian group, which had been the first to sequence a one mega, a read of over one megabase long. Um, so moving on to how we, um, how we extract the DNA and do the sequencing, um, Josh, we actually use the protocol developed by Josh and the Nanopore Whole Genome Sequencing Consortium. Um, we pretty much follow Josh's protocol exactly, so I'm not going to go through this because it's very well documented online. Um, but I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the properties of this ultra-high molecular weight and kind of the challenges associated in working with this. Um, this protocol is very good because it gives you a very high yield of DNA. We get over 500 micrograms of DNA um, when, we when we take five, to five times 10 to the seven cells. Um, and the concentration is extremely high. Often we get concentrations of up to five micrograms per microliter. And this is, this is almost physically impossible to work with. So when you're pipetting this, um, you can have a massive battle taking over 10 minutes to try and get your DNA out of the tube, and you don't always win the battle. This is sometimes just sucked straight back into the DNA matrix. So it's very important to kind of dilute this DNA down to a good, to a good range where it's quite homogenous. And this range is about one microgram per microliter, where you start to be able to work with this. But this is still extremely sticky. So if you look at, um, I'm trying to show here in these tubes, um, if you, s you have to very, very slowly take this DNA out to quantify it or to start your experiment. And you can see that it has this massive stretch and it just wants to pull that DNA back down. Um, but if you do this slowly enough and take a lot of time, you will eventually get um, a good amount of DNA out. Um, just quickly about QC. So there are several ways to QC this. Um, the most sensitive being using pulse field gel or the femtopulse. Unfortunately, we have neither of these machines. Um, we have the tape station and the pippin pulse. And uh, just to quickly go through, um, the tape station is quite good. It's quite cheap. It's only about three pounds per sample to check. Um, and it's extremely quick. You get your result in minutes. This has a very limited resolution, however. Um, but it can very quickly identify terrible samples. So we had one extraction from a bad cell pellet that was just highly degraded, you can see in the bottom profile. So the tape station profiles, you have a calibration marker um, on the left and then your DNA on the right. So generally for high molecular weight DNA, we just see these, pro these plots that show everything largely being over 60 kb. The pip and pulse we've really found quite useful. Um, can see um, this is an example of the gel here. You can see this is the um, this is the resolution of the 48 kb lambda genome that is sent as a control um, with most ONT kits. You can see um, some of our phenol chloroform extractions here. Um, so the resolution of this is between about 5 kb and 430 kb. You can see our phenol chloroform extractions are quite high molecular weight. You kind of get this compression zone, which kind of indicates you might have megabase DNA in your samples. We also see this from plug extractions, although this isn't so clear. 
Um, what we see is that when we do the extractions in-house, we quite often we get this nice high molecular weight prof profile, but sometimes when we get customer samples sent to us, um, this seems a lot, this is a lot lower molecular weight. So there's a limit to the read length we can, we can gain from these samples. Um, we also want to show that this is very nice for showing if you introduce a little bit of sharing in your DNA through needle sharing or G-tube sharing, um, you can have a good look at the size distribution of the shared material. <coughs> So once again, um, the ultra-long library prep protocol we're using is the modified RAD004 um, that Josh has also published. Um, as I mentioned, when we first started using this protocol, we had some very average results. So we've just made super minor tweaks to this. We still start with the 15 micrograms of DNA um, and about 15 to 18 microliters. Um, we then only add two microliters of the fragmentase and we very, very gently mix this with a wide bore pipette um, and follow through the rest of the protocol. Important things are it's quite good if you leave the um, wrap adapter ligation for longer than five minutes, so if you can leave for 10 to 15 minutes, um, this gives quite good results. And once you've loaded, your, oh, we don't include loading beads in our library um, reaction because this clumps with the DNA, so we just use water instead. Um, and once you've loaded your flow cell, this is a really thick glutinous material that kind of just slides in over about a minute. Um, it's best to leave this to tether for about 10 minutes. So we routinely get, so from our most recent runs, we're kind of routinely getting in 50s of over 100 KB, and we generally see megabase reads appearing in these runs. So for the run conditions, we've found, um, we, haven't really, we haven't done one of these runs on the latest version of Minnow, um, but on the older versions when we were doing these runs last, we were running these with um, active channel selection off, um, and to improve yield, we were stopping and restarting the run every two hours. So um, our director, Matt Luce, was in charge of doing this, so he would hate it when I would only start the runs at 6pm at night because he would be up right through the night um, stopping and restarting these runs for me. Um, a major limitation of this protocol is still the yield. Um, we get quite low yields out of these, um, and we think that, th and this is due to rapid flow cell blocking. Um, we haven't yet tried the nuclease flush protocol on these because it's such a massive amount of DNA we're putting onto the flow cell, we're kind of clogging it anyway, but I um, would be interested to see if this would work. Um, just a quick overview of some of the results we've been getting. Um, so we generally get only one to two gigabase of output of um, sequence data, um, and this can be quite sample, and also flow cell dependent. We get a lot more data out of really, really nice flow, flow cells, say with 1600 pores. Um, and we are getting N50s that are reaching up to about 100 KB. During this project, um, Alex Payne from our group and Matt Luce had worked on um, a program called BulkViz, which, um, can, which kind of delves down to the single pore level and looks at the current going, looks at the sequence traveling through the pore at any given time. Um, and as they were building this tool, they noticed that sometimes if you looked at the signal traces, you would see some strange aberrant current um, profiles that weren't consistent with the standard, um, with the standard read, um, read finishing or unblocking open pore adapter going in, and then another read starting. You would just see this weird peak, or you would see like what they what they proposed to be an attempted unblock, and then the signal would just continue um, like a read signal. And when they map these to the chromosome, you can see that these reads are located adjacent um, on the chromosome. So what they showed, sorry, I'm not explaining this so well, but what they were showing was that consecutive reads traveling through a pore mapped perfectly adjacently to the protocol. So this was fairly good evidence that um, this was in fact the same read, just the same molecule traveling through, but um, the read was being artificially split by Minot. Um, BulkViz can also correct this and fuse these, reads, fuse these split reads back together. And when you run this correction, you can see you get a large improvement in your read length. So um, this is before correction and then after correction, you see your read length can improve significantly. And you can also see that your N50 value, originally 90 KB, can go up to 135 KB. Um, it was using this, um, using this technology that we discovered our 2.3 megabase read. Um, you can see here is our 1.3 megabase read mapping to the genome, and you can see that our 2.3 megabase read actually consists of 11 reads that travelled consecutively um, through the same pore, and these mapped perfectly adjacently to the genome. <coughs> um, you can see the impact of correction. So this is um, 
This is part of the same figure I had on my previous slide, and the orange bars are just showing us that once you perform the correction, you do see a, ma you do see a marked improvement in your N50 scores. But this is also has run-to-run -run variability. You don't always see a large increase, but sometimes you see quite a significant increase in your N50 values. And on the bottom, we're just showing, um, showing what, an, what a 2.3 megabase read looks like um, in, in the context of the full chromosome. So um, very briefly, um, we've also had a bit of a go to see what our ultralong runs look like on Flongal and Prometheum. We did a scaled down um, standard ultralong prep and ran it on Flongal, and this actually worked really well. Um, we got a very good N50 of 113 kb. Um, the longest read was only 480 kb, but this still gave a really nice yield of ultra-long reads. Unfortunately, the same can't be said for Promethean. <laughs> we haven't tried this a lot, um, but this needs a lot of optimization. We have done a couple of runs where we see um, a fairly reasonable N50. We do see, la we do see long reads, kind of six, 700 kb, um, but we see very, very low yield. Um, and this is due to kind of extremely rapid pore blocking. And this, isn't a very, this is a very expensive thing to try to optimize on Promethean. So, um, yeah, we're kind of stuck at with this at the moment. So um, I'm quickly running out of time, so I'm going to have to quickly run through our extraction and sequencing on service samples. As a service um, provider, we get a lot of strange, wonderful things to sequence. Um, we've tried s sort of several diff difficult extractions, and you'll be able to access these slides later to kind of go through um, some of the different things we see from using these extraction protocols. Um, all of the, most of these still have quite high molecular weight. We generally hook this DNA out um, and yeah, can extract either long reads or shorter read sequences. So most service projects, they want to obviously obtain the highest yield of data and still get a good read length. So um, this is just another pip and pulse gel that I won't take time on. Um, I'd hope to run and compare these different libraries um, to, look for, to look for which ones blocked more or less and which gave the best read length profiles. Um, these runs, I and I tried to do these, the last runs on Monday night and didn't really get a good go at this. We find that if we just run our unshared DNA on Manayan, Flongal or Promethean flow cells, we, get, we don't get very nice read distributions. If we introduce some gentle sharing using um, needle sharing or G-tube, we start to get nicer read length distributions. So we've been lucky enough to have um, some companies come and train us with some of their new technologies. Um, we had Chris Bowles from Sage HLS come and show us the, um, say from the show us the Sage HLS extraction, which is um, an agarose gel all-in-one extraction protocol. You pop cells in, it does the cell lysis, it does a sh it does an enzymat enzymatic sharing, and then runs the DNA through a gel, then collects different bins of DNA of different molecular weights. We also had Circulomics come and show us their um, nanobind kit. And this is um, also a very nice extraction protocol. It's a single tube reaction um, where you lyse your cells, you then add um, some isopropanol and this magnetic nanobind disc and do an all-in-one tube kind of um, extraction, washing extraction protocol. Um, Circulomics also have the short read eliminator, which again is a single tube um, reaction. It's kind of a simple precipitation. Um, this is a very quick protocol and is very nice at removing very short molecular weight material from your sample. Um, and we've cleaned up some customer samples like this and ended up getting very nice um, N50s with nice um, read length distributions. Um, one, one interesting project we've haven't had in recently is extracting high molecular weight DNA from koala tissue. And I'm just putting this up to show you. Um, this was a difficult sample we had in. It came from um, the liver of a deceased koala. The poor koala had died and his body had just been popped in the minus 20. We managed to get a little bit of liver sample. Um, we could extract DNA from this by grinding under liquid nitrogen. Um, we then used, the sh we then used um, some needle, we then did a G sorry, a genomic tip extraction, did some needle sharing, used the short read eliminator, and we got some very nice um, read length distributions and yields out of this on Promethean. So it's a very quick summary. Um, it's really crucial to optimize your extraction protocol um, for the purpose of your project. Um, we find the best results when people can supply us with a lot of tissue so we can try, try some optimization steps. Um, and for LSK 109 libraries, we do find that some sharing is quite important um, to get a good yield. 
Um, we've been doing a lot of looking at um, cleaning, up our, cleaning up our samples before library prep using size selection. Um, and we're very, we've used um, Blue Pippin a lot, and we've started to use the Circular Mix Short Read Eliminator. We're very excited to try the John Tyson um, bead-free LSK, LSK 109 protocol that Josh has just mentioned. Um, and we're really keen to kind of move more into doing more into looking at extending our yields um, by using the nuclease flush protocol or trying to generate libraries that block less. Um, I think I'm just out of time and so I'd better leave it here. Um, but I'd like to just acknowledge um, everyone from DeepSeek, um, everyone from um, Alex from the Loose Lab, um, Darren Crowley from our cell culture lab who's, pr who's, who's kindly prepared all of the cells for um, these extraction comparisons, um, collaborators on some of our long read protocols, and people from Sage Science and Circulomics. Thank you.